The idea is not a new one. In fact, it goes back at least to the 1870s to the Milanese geologist Antonio Stefani, who back then suggested that humans had already become agents of geological change on planet Earth. And he was so confident of this idea that he coined the term Anthropozoic Era to denote the actions of humans. The term didn't find favour in the geological literature, though. You can't really find any evidence of it if you look in the writings of 20th century geologists. But it was resurrected at the start of the 21st century by the famous atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen, who again suggested that humans had become agents of geological change. And in this case, he coined the term Anthropocene to denote that, that impact. Now, we, as paleontologists, are the custodians of the geological record of the biosphere. We can track its origins four billion years ago. We can look at its globalization as it invents photosynthesis, the development of the eukarya, <coughs> the, envelop the, the development of multicellularity, and then, and maybe I'm a bit biased, perhaps the most fundamental change of the biosphere is its transition from its microbial state into its complex metazoan state that characterizes the Phanerozoic eon. Against this backdrop of change, against all of these innovations in the biosphere over four billion years, can we measure the impact of humans to see if our impact is, is significant? Do we live in an Anthropocene biosphere? So I want to ask some fundamental questions are we in a new stage of the biosphere? If we are, what characterizes it? And when did it actually evolve? We could start by thinking about extinction. Extinction may be one of the characteristic defining geological impacts of humans. There are various debates and discussions about where the humans are driving a mass extinction at present. Some people would suggest that extinction rates are already well above background levels. Now, whether we agree with that or not, we may all probably agree that species with very small ranges are increasing quickly, and it's those species that are disproportionately more likely to go extinct as a result of human impact. So extinction may be a defining component of the Anthropocene epoch of geological time, but of course it won't be a defining characteristic of an Anthropocene biosphere. It's something which has happened at least five times in the Phanerozoic eon, it's an important impact, but it's not a defining characteristic of a new biosphere state. So what might be entirely unique about the biosphere that we live in at present? We think there are at least four characteristics, four interrelated characteristics that define a new state for the biosphere. So we could start by thinking about this from an ecological perspective. We could look at the position of humans in the trophic structure of the marine and terrestrial ecosystems. So let's look at an ecological approach, taking primary producers as level one in the trophic, trophic structure and apex predators as level five. Now taking that approach, humans would come out at about a mid-level with a trophic value of about 2.21. That would place us in the middle of those ecosystems, not as the apex predators. In fact, it would place us at about the same level as anchovy in the oceans or pigs in the terrestrial biosphere. Now, that's one way of looking at it, but it's probably not the best way of looking at it from the perspective of our impact, because clearly we have displaced the apex predators both in the marine and terrestrial ecosystems. So this is the first parameter that we would say is unique about the modern biosphere and characterises a difference from past biosphere states. This is our appropriation of somewhere between 25 and 40% of net primary production of potential vegetation. That's a staggering figure for a single species to appropriate on planet Earth. We can put this another way. If you look at the dry mass by carbon of humans and their commensal species, we're 175 million tonnes, compared to 5 million tonnes in the wild mammal component of the biosphere. So we represent 97% with our commensal animals of the mammal component of the biosphere by mass. If you then add to that fossil debt primary production, because humans also utilise this, 
you're, you're commandeering a huge amount of energy in the biosphere. Perhaps as much energy in the biosphere now appropriated by humans as existed prior to humans in the whole terrestrial biosphere. It's not just a terrestrial signal, this is also a marine signal. Humans have a huge impact on the marine, marine structure. We fish huge quantities of fish, 158 million tonnes a year, and significantly, 42% of that is aquaculture. So that's our impact on driving production in the oceans. So that's parameter one. Parameter two, the neobiota. These are organisms, microbes, animals, and plants translocated around planet Earth by humans, both directly and indirectly. And here we have a global signature of translocation. Of course, this has happened in the past. We know many instances where continents have joined together, and there have been migrations of organisms between those continents. The Great American Interchange, three million years ago, is the classic example of this of the geological record. But what's happening at present, present is <coughs> unprecedented. This is a global signal, and that global signal follows the patterns of long-lived and dense human population. So that even areas which are geographically isolated, like New Zealand, now have nearly as many neobiotic plant species as they have indigenous species. That's a fundamental change. This is not just a terrestrial signal, it's also a marine signal. If you look at just one species, the lionfish, which is there in the background, originating in the seas of Southeast Asia and now significantly damaging the reef systems of the Caribbean. Parameter three is modified landscapes, anthropes. The way in which humans have modified the landscape of the organisms that live in those, that live in those landscapes. And that would be very evident just looking out of this room at the center of Cardiff City. This is neatly summarized in the work of Earl Ellis, one of the co-authors on this paper, who's at the University of Maryland. And what Earl has done is to quantify the anthropogenic impact <coughs> of different components of the landscape. Now, this is a really nice figure. This is your impact as a species in 1700. And this is your impact as a species 300 years later. So that 75% of the ice-free surface of planet Earth is now significantly impacted by humans with modified ecosystems, such that we can state that the world is no longer dominated by natural ecosystems with humans disturbing them, but rather is dominated by human systems with more or less modified natural ecosystems embedded within them. And of course, within those ecosystems are modified biota, a process which has been unfolding in about several million years since we and our ancestors first used technology. To the extent that we can now potentially translate the photosynthetic mechanisms of prokaryotic algae into higher plants to increase productivity. That's the level of our impact. From super plants to not so super chickens, Look at what humans have done to chicken biomass in a few decades. We've quadrupled the individual biomass of, a, of, a, of an individual chicken. Parameter four is the technosphere. And this is perhaps the most significant of all of the changes to the biosphere that's taken place over the last few hundred years. So the technosphere is you, the society you belong to, all the technological artifacts that underpin that, and all the technology that supports you. The two are interrelated. You cannot exist without the technology around you. We can't maintain a population of seven billion human beings and all their commensal animals without that technology. But equally, the technosphere needs you to sustain it. So at the moment, there's a kind of synergistic relationship going on between the technosphere and the biosphere. The technosphere is growing out of the biosphere, and who knows where it might go in the future. Some people have also seen the technosphere as a parasite, using up the raw materials that the biosphere needs to sustain itself. This is a staggering figure. This is technospheric consumption on a grand scale. Between 2011 and 2013, China used more cement than the United States used in the entire 20th century. So this really is technospheric consumption on a grand scale.
And you can see it visibly in the landscape of human architecture. The regional styles that characterise different parts of planet Earth through until the 20th century coalesce into an international style that you can see spreading across the world in the middle part of the 20th century. Cardiff city centre is a wonderful example of this. And of course this is predicated on the movement of steel and glass, cement and commodities around the world by the technosphere with all of the huge embedded energy that's part of that. So if you agree that humans have had a fundamental impact on the biosphere, and you might vehemently disagree with me, that would, be, that would be great also, when did this biosphere actually evolve? We can look at patterns of change over millions of years. It's a bit like the transition from a microbial to a metazoan biosphere. It unfolds as a continuum over a very long period of time. We could think about the initial stages of the human impact with tool use, dating back millions of years. But then think about the 20th century and the 21st century and the explosive diversity of morphologies that have evolved in that mid-20th century to fill the ecologies that humans are engineering. And I'm putting ecology here in inverted commas because this, this room that we're all sitting in is potentially human ecology. It's not a very good one for the biosphere, in fact it's fairly terrible, but it's really good for the technosphere. It's evolving to fill all of these different spaces. That also dovetails with what economists would call the Great Acceleration, the transition, transition in the late 20th century to a period when we all wanted technology, computers, televisions, white goods, cars. And it dovetails with another human impact, the ability of humans to use atomic energy sources also, to supplement the primary solar sources and the sources that we use from fossil net primary production also. So we could think about the middle part of the 20th century as perhaps being a very good place where we might define this global impact of humans on the biosphere. Now we should also think about future trajectories. We shouldn't just think about the past. Where might this actually be taking us? So there are three, three or perhaps more possible trajectories that we might be on in terms of where we are heading with the biosphere. The first of these is a worrying one. The Anthropocene biosphere is a short-lived experiment that proves unsustainable and may be associated with mass extinction. And that's not going to be good for the biosphere. It's not going to be very good for us. The next one is me being a little bit flippant, but I think we should also contemplate this. The technosphere is an emergent system. We don't know where it might go. It might evolve to a stage where it's also sustainable in its own right. This is the scenario that I think is the best scenario, and there may be more scenarios. This is the scenario where the technosphere and the biosphere develop a synergy, where they are able to cohabit, where they become symbiotic, and where they contribute to longevity of the system over geological timescales. Now, if you accept that as one potential outcome, then you're dealing with a state shift that may persist over geological timescales. And then in that third scenario, perhaps we really are dealing with a new stage of the biosphere. And one hopes that the Paris Agreement on Climate Change might actually be one of the contributing factors here to some kind of synergy developing between the technosphere and the biosphere. That's the final point I wanted to leave you with. Thank you.